Convivial Studio created an exhibition about coral reefs and plankton for the Aquarium of the Pacific in Long Beach. The development process led us to meet inspiring scientists, experts and makers. This video series shows the dedicated people that are working in the field and the making of the exhibition. I'm uh, Christian Sardé. I'm a French biologist and uh, I've done research at the marine station in Villefranche-sur-Mer. Plankton doesn't live too long in the laboratory, so you have to collect it. We get fresh plankton here in Villefranche morning and afternoon. All these tiny organisms are mixed here and then you just collect them and start um, isolating them, cleaning them, and then start filming the different types of plankton and filming their behavior. It's done using different uh, means depending on their size. The bigger one, which we don't have here, is a big jellyfish. You have to film scuba diving. And then uh, bigger organisms you do with macro lenses or in aquariums. And um, the very small organisms, you have to use microscopes. Motivation to photograph and film plankton and make stories about plankton was an expedition that we organized 10 years ago, exactly, uh, called Tara Oceans. This expedition was going to make a global survey of plankton in all oceans. It was going to be mostly genomics, that is, sequencing all the organisms collecting all the plankton in the water column, sequencing these organisms to know who was there and in what quantity, and imaging them with automated methods. We started filming the diversity of plankton and uh, writing short stories about the different types of plankton for the public as a, as a means of communication. For the Aquarium of the Pacific exhibition, we installed more than 100 delicate plankton glass sculptures. The sculptures were created by glass artists Susan Liebold, Peter Kuschinke and Masami Hirohata. The sculptures were inspired by specific categories of plankton called radiolarians, diatoms and foraminiferas. My name is Peter Kusinke. I'm the last blower living in Gouda in Sweden at the factory. And I've been a glass blower for uh, about 35 years. We are in Boda, in the middle of the glass kingdom of Sweden, down in Småland, in a place called the Glass Factory. For the central part of the exhibition at the aquarium, we developed an artwork around the hidden world of plankton. We were really fascinated with the transparency and luminous textures of these organisms and wanted to capture these features. To avoid using materials like plastic, we turned to glass as a medium. Glass is made from abundant raw materials, sand, soda ash and limestone. Plankton, such as foraminifera, fall to the ground as they die and become part of the sediment. So it felt logical to use glass for these sculptures. Planktonic organisms are incredibly mesmerizing with those seemingly infinite varieties of shapes, colors and textures. In order to translate this diversity, we wanted to experiment with different techniques. Some shapes were much more challenging to create, especially the intricate and spiky radiolarians. Fortunately, Peter is a very experienced and skilled glass artist and accepted the challenge. One technique we used to create plankton surfaces was to use custom molds. With glass melting from around 1400 degrees Celsius, we had to use materials such as metal and clay for the mold making. 
We also created software to generate 3D surfaces from algorithms such as reaction diffusion and cellular noise, as those are looking very similar to the organic textures found on planktonic organisms. Then we inverted those 3D surfaces and carved them into aluminium blocks to be used as 3D imprints for the glass. Another technique we used was to manually create patterns and shapes in clay. These clay molds could only be used once, however, as they were destroyed by the heat in the process. For a specific type of foraminifera plankton, we created open frames using metal threads. When the glass was blown into those delicate structures, organic blob-like shapes appeared. Plankton also have fascinating colors and reflective properties. So glass was a good medium to explore those colors and textures. The exhibition contains matte foraminifera, shimmering golden and iridescent diatoms, and translucent radiolarians. A large part of the exploration of early biology was done with these transparent organisms, most of them being marine and most of them being planktonic. So it has had a huge impact on biology since the beginning. We were intrigued by another glassmaking technique, which can be used to create extremely intricate and complex structures. This was a great method to conjure up some of the delicate mineral plankton skeletons we had found in our research. Our search led us to another brilliant glass artist named Susan Liebold. My name is Susan Liebold, and we are in the deep forest of Thuringia, in the Slate Mountains, in an old gasworks. I found my passion for glass as a child. I was eight years old when I used a gas burner for the first time and started to assemble small objects. This technique is called lamp working. It refers to this gas burner, this apparatus that used to be called a glass blower lamp. A mixture of gas and oxygen gives the flame a temperature of over a thousand degrees Celsius. The glass melts at around 700 to 800 degrees and can then be shaped. I perceive the technique to be very similar to a growth process in nature. Things develop out of themselves, piece by piece. You cannot accelerate these processes either. Borosilicate glass has special properties. For one, it is very transparent, very clear, similar to a rock crystal and it has a higher melting point than many other soft glasses, sodalime glasses. This higher melting point also means that it can be heated several times without cracking. Because I can heat it up more often, I can continue working on the same piece and shape and change it again and again.
In collaboration with Christian, Sadi and Pardons, we created a generative application simulating plankton organisms drifting in the Pacific current, which were then projected in the immersive exhibition. There is no question that we have greatly influenced the life in the ocean by overfishing and now by putting a lot of CO2 in the ocean. So that's acidification of the coastal areas mostly, which makes it hard for some organisms like the, some mollusks who make their shells they will have trouble making their shells. So since the industrial times, we have modified the conditions in the ocean. And nobody knows really what the situation is about plankton. There's no question that the increase in temperature is causing a lot of plankton to migrate towards the poles. It's also changing the way the water masses are mixing. So this will definitely have a lot of influence on uh, planktonic ecosystem and because the planktonic ecosystem is so important to capture actually the CO2 through photosynthesis, our action could have really bad consequences for the future, but nobody is able to really predict what will happen. But it's a source of worry for sure. Thank you.